just take what you get. Try to learn as much as you can because you're still young, brother. How old are you? Uh, I you get. I turned 29 in a couple months. You're still a baby. Yeah. Your your 30s are your prime, yeah. and it's good you got eight years in now. You're ready to rock and roll, man. Yep. You know what I mean? You're ready to rock and roll. It's just maybe we will cross paths. Oh, bro, I'm booking you next summer. <laughs> Our first guest is a rising star out of Ontario, Canada, with eight years in the business. Now he's making his name known. He's a current heavyweight champion over at Crossbody Pro Wrestling. You might know him as Big Scary. Please welcome Holden Albright to the show. Hello there. How are you doing, Jonah? I'm doing great. Thank you so much for coming on. Thank you for this opportunity. I'm very excited. Absolutely. And... Our next guest is a legend in the industry who has made his name known all around the world in places like Japan, Germany, Cuba, I just heard most recently, and of course in ECW, where he's an ECW original, former ECW TV champion, former tag team champion. Please welcome Pitbull number one, Gary Wolf. Pleasure to be here, guys, man. It's awesome. <laughs> It is awesome. I'm really excited to have you both here. I know this is going to be a great one. So I always like to start at the beginning. I'll go to you first, Holden, and just want to learn your journey and your first experiences with pro wrestling. Uh, so I, I literally saw a breakfast program once feature a wrestling school when I was like in grade six or seven. I was there for two classes, and then my parents lied to me and said my grades weren't good. They just didn't want to pay for the wrestling school. And then fast forward about 10, 12 years later, a uh, trip fell through and I had money. So I was like, oh, well, I'm going to join this wrestling school. And I had I had no ideas of grandeur of even being a halfway decent wrestler. I just wanted to have one match. And then the last eight years, I've had good matches and bad matches, and uh, which has led me here, which I'm very excited, though, to be chatting with Gary, actually. Yeah. Nice. Where'd you go to school at? So I started at Squared Circle Training, and it's like Rob Fuego in Toronto. It was a, it started with uh, Ron Hutchinson, and then like the the breaking down of the different schools. So with Squared Circle under Rob Fuego, and then a school opened up called Super Kicked. And but I'm one of those people that, without burning bridges, I had like a year and a half, almost two years of training, and it was. The first school closed down four months into it, and luckily there's other schools around. There's some veterans that I was able to learn from, and constantly learning from different people is beneficial, not having just one person. So I got all this different experience, and in the eight years, I am, I can confidently say now during the pandemic, I'm a better wrestler than I thought I was, but it's all because of all these people that took me under their wings, and I wasn't a shithead, so they wanted to give me advice. <laughs> nice nice yeah that's how it goes usually man usually if you're cool and the, like the old timers like me like bob orton cowboy bob orton and the samoans and them guys they opened big doors for me and my partner because i mean we wouldn't have did it we wouldn't have went where we went if we weren't tight with king curtis and don morocco and them guys like they opened doors for us so and i still to this day even you i'm sure even though you've been working eight years, you're still learning every time oh, you yeah. get in the ring. You learn something. Absolutely. And that's that's like the real brotherhood of helping each other out. It's not that like ribbing is like fun and stuff, but it's not, oh, you're younger than me. I've definitely got a lot of opportunities from picking up people from the airport because I was the only one with a car and just doing those 10 hour drives and just learning so much in the cars. Well, you're paying your dues then. That's a good thing. Oh, I still set up rings every chance I get. It's a, it's a nice little workout. I'm not going to tie the aprons because I'm not going to do that. But, like, I'll lift up the heavy things. <laughs> nice. <laughs> well, well, Gary, I'll throw it to you now. What What is your journey like into pro wrestling? Because you mentioned, I mean, obviously, amazing career, great experiences. But where did it all begin? I was in Wildwood, New Jersey. I had my own businesses on the boardwalk. So at that time... You know, I was just working out. I was like trying to be a bodybuilder, I guess. I was young, 18, 19. And uh, WWE, you would do a Monday night Raw from Wildwood, New Jersey on the boardwalk. Oh, cool. In the summer. Yeah. yeah. So they asked us to be security for the gym. The guys own the gym. So we went, we snuck in actually Monday afternoon. <laughs> Me, my partner, 
uh, Crybaby Waldo was with us, and he passed away, though. And the Leatherface, Andy Bernowski, good friend of mine who plays Leatherface in the uh, Texas Chainsaw Massacre, he was with us. And Dick Worley was just hanging out, you know, because it was early in the afternoon, and we just snuck in. And we wanted to see how the ring felt. We had no idea, you know. And the ring beat the shit out of us. I mean, I'm not going to lie to you. You know what I mean? I, I, I walked out of there the next day. I, I woke up and said, there ain't no f***ing way I'm going to be a wrestler. There's no, no, no way. Absolutely not. Like, I couldn't work out for two weeks. That's how bad I was sore, you know, I, because I didn't know how to bump. I didn't know how to do anything. Right. So after that, I mean, me and my partner, we, like we, like I said, I had a board, I had a store on the beach on the boardwalk and shit. So we're <laughs> always in the water, you know, and we just started practicing suplexes and shit like that. And just to see how it felt, you know, and finally my, finally my partner said, you know what, I'm going to go join that monster factory. It's only 40 minutes from our house. Yeah. And I'm like, you're fucking shitting me. You know, like <laughs> we didn't we didn't realize we were in a really great. I mean, I know people that moved from Vegas to go to the Monster Factory. Right. Yeah. And and slept in the school. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So, you know, we were very fortunate that we happened to be in that area. So I don't know, wouldn't you know it? He he joined a month later. I joined in 88. And by 1990, we signed our first Japan contract. Wow. That's so cool to be able to go to Japan so early on too, like in your career. I feel like now you usually see guys, they, they have a career first in the United States, then they go to Japan. What was it like getting that, <laughs> that style, like first and foremost? Oh, it was great. It was great because it opened up other doors for us, you know, overseas and stuff. Yeah. Like we would be all, I mean, if we weren't in Japan, we were in Germany. If yeah. we weren't in Germany, we were in New Zealand. I mean, I lived in Australia for nine months i mean we were doing we were pulling 13s on television i mean it was crazy and it was the bruise brothers the headhunters the samoans uh, right. nails was with us you know they they had i mean man uh mark lewin was the boss purple haze you know what i'm saying <laughs> so him and kevin Sullivan, we remember them guys yeah and uh, but, i'm so sorry uh, can i ask you because i've heard the wwf ring in the 80s which is brutal and like what it was the different because mexico it's a very much a let's roll around because of the ring. what is the different rings from like new zealand to germany to japan in the early 90s like were they all like that no japan had stiff rings mm. they were stiff rings <laughs> and vince's ring was like a fucking match <laughs> <laughs> i'm not gonna lie and the only different and, and the thing i didn't like about vince's ring it was his rings were like 22 feet, I think. Yeah. You know, they're big, yeah. big rings, you know, and when you're hitting the ropes there, you got, and I'm not that tall. I'm only like five, nine. Mm -hmm. So I have to make sure I get my arm over that top rope. You know what I mean? <laughs> you know, I'm like right there. You know what I mean? Yeah. It, it's, you, you could tell if you watch my old stuff, especially when I was doing the jobs and I'd go in and me and Ant got to work against every tag team that the eighties had, which was, so much experience that we can't we couldn't get that it was like it fell into our lap you know like gorilla monsoon would call larry sharp and say look you know you know vince is going to be in uh, niagara falls or vince is going to be at hershey park send the guys up you know what i mean and let them see how we really work how the business is you know i remember meeting hulk hogan that was 19 maybe 20 years old and he could have been a total jerk off, but he was the nicest guy. One of the nicest guys I met. I mean, he literally stopped, shook my hand. I introduced myself. I told him I was from the monster factory because that's what you have to do nowadays. You know, you go in a locker room. Back then I was taught, you know, you show respect. So you go around to every single person, shake their hand, introduce yourself, you know, and, and meet them, you yeah. know, because you're going to learn from them. And that's how I was brought up. You know, I would even go up to the main event and say, thank you for the house. You know, some people don't even know what that means right now. Yep. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So, but I was, I've been very lucky. I, I've been in locker rooms with Terry Funk to Stan Hansen to Abdul the Butcher to Ric Flair. You see what I'm saying? So uh, I've been in the, I've been in the locker room with everybody, brother, everybody. 
And that respect thing is something that, like, pe- I hate in my generation, people will, like, consider that as, like, a hassle, where it's like, no, it's just a respect thing. Like, as a man, I'm shaking people's hands, saying hello, and especially at the end of the night, because I... I will sometimes have a hardcore or street fight that is very much what am I not allowed to do. And I make sure that at the end of the night, I'm thanking the person that served the bar, uh, the drinks there. I'm thanking the person that's the janitor that has to clean it up. I'm thanking the person who owns the building. I am thanking them because without them, I don't, there's no ring set up. There's no platform for us to perform and do our job. No, you're right. You're right along. It's a great mentality. Holden, I want to go to you now. For those who haven't seen your persona, it's very intriguing. It's it's eye-catching, I think, with the different heads that I've seen you wear, the big heads. And so I'll let you explain that. Uh, But I'm curious if it was always your persona. Like, what were you like when you first broke into the business? Uh, So when I first, uh, like, my first gimmick or character, I was basically just, like, a fighter kind of dude, just like a UFC-style camp. I had a snapback hat with my name on it and a shirt, and I wasn't selling the shirt. The shirt was only for me, and it looked like I was a fighter that's going into their match. And then it took some time to develop, because I got some good advice by Ethan Page, who's on AEW now, of... Mm -hmm gimmicks will come just be a wrestler first just wrestle like that's all you need to do to, and you'll figure it out as it goes and and i had the benefit that like two or three years into wrestling i had that moment of oh should i just quit because it's kind of tough and people are kind of pieces of shit <laughs> or should i just like ri- just bet on myself figure out what is going on and i got that opportunity in a tag team with a bunch of my buddies and we just the chains were off sort of say of just well let's try whatever what's the worst thing i don't get booked anymore cool i get to live a normal life in my 20s still and then it became i got opportunities to wrestle more because i i went to shows when i wasn't booked i I just love wrestling. So that Friday to Sunday, I was at any show and every show that I could go to from Chicago to Quebec and just literally just wrestling, wrestling, wrestling. And then I got the opportunity to start doing single stuff. And I, I bought a Halloween bunny mask. Cause I was like, Oh, this looks weird. Let me wear it to the ring. And then I got hit in the head with a ladder. And even though I got my hand up, it was like the Terry Funk style around. And it still cracked me that like we tried to super glue it and it did not work. It was that swelled open. And I, I used that to go a little more crazy with it. And I had this wolf mask. I named it Walter and I broke it down to those little voices in our head that tell us, oh, if we had this opportunity, we would kill this person right now or we would beat the hell out of them. But we don't do that because it's illegal. That's what prevents us most of the time, to be honest. And I was like, well, if I take that and I put it onto the wolf mask, that's my internal thought process. And then also there was a promo I did in my first like two months in wrestling. And I said, I wanted to be remembered for in the record books because as long as there's videos, I'm a part of wrestling history. And now because I went a little more crazy with it, I go, oh, I don't want to be remembered by championships and victories. I want to be remembered from my victims. When they wake up in the hospital, I put them there. When they look at that scar on their arm, it's from me. When they wake up in the middle of the night in cold sweats, they're thinking of their matches with me. And that's where it goes a little deeper where it's other people are like, oh, well, I am this character from this movie and I do flips and I wrestle this way where it's, it goes a little darker with me. And that's why I, I'm a nice enough guy. Cause if I go into those thoughts, I'm pretty sure I'm going to end up like Heath Ledger. So I try to be happy outside of the ring. But when that wolf mask is on, there is a whole nother Holden Albright versus Brendan Caulfield is very different. Oh, that's so cool. I love the, the thought process. And Gary, do you have any thoughts on that or like advice on character development in general? Because a lot of people, I think, might see the put the pit bulls as like an ecw thing but you came up with that right like you trademarked the whole name you came up with the gimmicks yourself right absolutely yeah i mean before when we, when we were going to school i mean they always told us at larry's was this charlie fulton was there from out of ohio who, who would train us most of the time and that's when bammer and bear was just leaving the school uh, the godfather yeah charlie would always tell us and larry would say don't worry about your gimmick. That's the last thing you should be worrying about right now. First, learn how to wrestle. Yeah. Then you're going to, then we'll figure out what kind of gimmick you're going to have. So that's what we did. We just was learning how to work. 
And I didn't know what kind of gimmick. I was thinking of gimmicks, but I didn't even think we were going to be a tag team. I thought we were just going there together and we're just going to see what happens. I mean, I was going to call myself Luscious Larry Lips <laughs> and, and do like an Adrian Street or an Adrian Adonis gimmick and have lips on my ass. And my finish was going to be, I'll shoot the guy in, my ass hits him in the face and he's done. One, two, three. <laughs> You know, old school, you know? <laughs> oh, yeah. But that never happened. So, I mean, what happened was, you know, we always were fans of the British Bulldogs. We were fans of, you know, a lot of good tag teams out there, like the Guerrero brothers, you know, all them guys. Demolition. Mm -hmm. and that's even before it's time. But regardless, uh, one day Larry was like, you know, you two look good together. You know what I mean? Why don't you guys team up and – so we just started working as a tag team and it just started flowing and come to find out, I mean, we were both from the same hometown, right. same town in New Jersey, went to the same high school, but he had his crowd. I had my crowd, mm -hmm. you know, we really didn't hang out much, you know, but we ended up bumping into to each other in the gym and that's how we became friends. And like I said, I had him working for me and that's when we realized, wait a minute, let's do it. And we did it. And, uh, that was the last thing to come up with was the name. And I remember I was like, man, what should we call us? You know, I'm trying to figure it out. Yeah. And it was Pitbull. It was Pitbull Express. And then because of the Midnight Express, we didn't know what to do. You know, we didn't want to copy off the Bulldogs. We didn't want to call ourselves the Bulldogs. And come to find out I had Pitbulls at the time. And I would breed Pitbulls at the time. Mm -hmm. And a little bird came in my ear and whispered, why don't you call yourselves the Pitbulls? Yeah. <laughs> so we, we said we're the pit bulls and then Don Morocco chimed in and said, yes, that's what I want to call you. The American pit bulls, your rabid Rex and your psychotic spike. And that's the names he gave us. So, so I trade. Yeah. So I trade, I trademarked the pit bulls. Yeah. So they, I own that. And I've owned that since 1988, 89. Yeah. Cause because Vince yeah. tried to steal, Vince tried to steal my gimmick. He I'm did sure it. Oh yeah, yeah. He put Jamie Noble and oh, Jim yes. Cash together. Yeah. Now, see, I got the phone call while they were taping that night. <laughs> okay, so I knew before he even made it on television what was going on. Wow. So I just called my lawyer, and my lawyer, you know, right away, my lawyer got the letter out, and right away they sent me a letter back, thinking that. I'm full of shit because I guess Paul Heyman was there at the time and said that I own that name and no, you don't. And my lawyer sent him another letter and said, listen, you know, well, first of all, I, I talked to kid cash and I said, why don't you just get me talk to triple H and get triple H to bring me in and I'll manage you guys. Mm -hmm. This way it gives you at least some credibility Exactly, because they got, they got booed out of the building in Philadelphia. At the spectrum, and they, they did they it in Philadelphia. Out, what a slap yeah! They the did face. it in Philadelphia yeah. on spite because, like, you got to remember, I turned Vince down at least twice. Bro. Mm -hmm. I turned him down two times, so he, I guess, he's bitter about it. I don't know, <laughs> but like I, like I said, Kid Cash even told Triple H, "Look, bring Gary in, let him manage us. You put the fucking belts on us. L at least let's make it legit." Mm -hmm. He didn't want to do that, so that's when I said, "Okay." My lawyer sent the letter. Look. You're going to start paying me, like it or not. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you have to stop. This is a cease and desist, and that's yeah. it. So they stripped them immediately of the titles, and they, they threw the, the gimmick away. And they're stupid. They're stupid. <laughs> and, they're, and they're being greedy, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? And they're not being – but they, like I said, they knew that night they got booed out. Yeah. yeah. They didn't want to pay me, so he, he just – Got rid of it. How were you so? Uh, how were you so smart to trademark so early? Question. Because of the old timers, bro. They would tell me, like Robert Fuller. He, this is one thing he would always tell me. He's like, "Listen, you know, when you start making money, buy a house, own a house, own your own home. This way, you're not on the street." I mean, when I was 18, I already owned my own house in Philadelphia. You know what I'm saying? So, because I was smart enough. Okay, I made some money. I mean, back then you could get a row home for 10 grand and then throw 30 grand into it and you got a nice house. You know, now these row homes are getting sold for $300,000. Mm -hmm. Crazy, man.
I wish I I could have had six fucking houses, six row homes. I'm sick. <laughs> money I lost, man. Holden, for you. So you explained your persona, the inspiration for it. And I watched a few of your matches. I've seen that you had a great match against Colby Durst uh, recently. And then actually, no, I think it was the one with the bunny mask that you were just referring yeah. to, the, the Halloween one. And but then I've also seen matches like you were talking about, like you get into these street fight style matches. And so I see these two styles of you. And for someone who's never seen you, how would you describe it? Uh, I am very much just I, I'm one of the more versatile wrestlers, too. I'll have like a solid eight to ten, even like super indie style match. But like I've had 60 minute Iron Man matches. I've had death matches. I I just love wrestling so much. So when promoters are like, hey, do you want to do this? I'm like, yep, here's my booking fee. Yep, I'm free that day. Let's go. Let And I I literally could have a 20 minute depending who I'm wrestling, it might not be the best on the fly match, but it'll be an on the fly match to like a oh, planned wow. out thing to a strong style match. And it's just, I, I try to be versatile enough that like one of the guys that trained me is actually one of the current, uh, the current uh, X division champion for impact wrestling. And is, his name's Josh Alexander. And he is just yeah. brutal and very much like it might be a little uh, old school ish way of he taught me more while wrestling him that we wrestled matches like every three to four months and he wouldn't beat the shit out of me. I do not want to say he beat the shit out of me. But it was a war when we wrestled. It's the bloody chest after like a chop and just the intensity. And that's what taught me like ECW is so great. Like especially watching a bunch of the Pitbull stuff earlier today of just like that intensity is that thing that most wrestlers are lacking. That that's what gets the fans involved. Like that's just like the intensity. And it's just great for that of like even because I, I want to ask Gary about this because you were in it in the moment of ECW. This past weekend with Matt Cardona, him getting pelted with uh, debris and stuff at GCW was very reminiscent to old ECW of like legitimate heat of just being fired up of some people said it was disrespectful throwing it in the ring. But even when even when Hogan turned at Bash at the beach and he throws in that garbage, he cuts the promo and looks around and goes, this garbage is just like all the fans. Like, Gary, from your perspective of being in that heat and knowing what it's like to have fans, especially with, like, the broken neck and stuff like that, what what is real? Because I've not experienced real heat, but, like, what is that feeling like? It's intense. I mean, we were in Florida, Fort Lauderdale, and it was pit bulls versus public enemy, double dog collar. Yeah. The ring collapsed. The ring collapsed. And what happened was the fans just jumped the guardrail and jumped in the ring. And as a matter of fact, it might have been because the fans jumped in the ring that the ring collapsed. Now that I'm thinking yeah. about it, <laughs> it was very odd. Like I was very scared because I was in a pile under chairs because everybody just started throwing chairs. It was insane. So the first thing I could do was grab a chair, put it over my head and I hit the ground. And I, all I remember is I was completely covered in chairs outside the ring. And I remember the ring collapsed. Wow. And uh, that was really the only time I was very scared because somebody started pulling me out and I'm like, wait a minute, who the f pulling me out you know and it's a 400 pound guy and i don't know who this guy is and as he's pulling me out i'm thinking to myself okay i gotta i gotta i gotta hit this dude i can't let him touch me you know so i wind back to hit him and i remember johnny grunge grabbing my arm and saying no no he's one of us he's one of us <laughs> no you know but that 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 time man it was scary you know it was scary but yeah. when uh the, the, the hottest heat and the whitest heat that I've ever seen and I was ever involved in was when I did get thrown down in the halo when people jumped the guardrail. Yeah. They wanted to kill he, Shane, right? They wanted to kill him, bro. They wanted to kill him. I mean, they, they were calling his house after the fact and literally threatening his life. Fans were. It was insane. I mean, and... I'm not going to lie. I mean, that night that I had to wait a year and a half, man, for Rick Rude to bring me back in. And then that was an honor to have him do that, you know, and he had no problem doing that. I mean, he would come and hang out with my at my house every weekend when we were working. So 
him and Steve Austin, all them guys that were everybody that went through ECW pretty much because my house was only 10 blocks away from the <laughs> arena. You know, so we were partying before we even went to the arena. So yeah. All the guys like to hang out at my place. <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing. What is it like partying with someone like Steve Austin? Oh, it's cool. You know, yeah. you just can't mark out. He's just like he's just like all of us. Right. He's the same person, you know. When you're in, when is when he's in his gimmick and he's his character, he could be very intense. You know, he, he's an intense dude anyway. You know what I'm saying? He don't take no bullshit. <laughs> you know, and the funny part about it is, you know, Vince wasn't even interested in hiring him, you know, until until Jim Ross saw him cut a promo on R E C W television. And I remember to this day, Steve was just like, man, Bischoff fired me, that piece of shit, you know, because I hurt my, blew my tricep and, you know, I, I get it, you know, but Paul would never, I blew my tricep, Paul didn't fire me, he let me fix it and I came right back, Right. you know, so it was a difference there. Mm -hmm. So he was like, so I just told him and the boys would tell him, you know what, tell them to, fucking, like I tell everybody when they do promos. Cut a promo, you tell them the truth. Mm -hmm. Speak the truth. It's the best way. So he did an eight-minute promo, and Vince McMahon wanted him minutes later. It was over. Wow. That's awesome. Holden, do you have any thoughts on that, your promos, for your promo style? So I, uh, I'm, a, I'm a firm believer in, like, keep your promos under a minute, and even especially because I do have, like, the more <laughs> – I'm not a horror movie guy at all, but I do like true crime and like those like beheading videos. I'm a little weird in that way. And like my my promos literally I in my mind and this is where like I think deeply into it. I think there's an evidence locker room in some police station called the Albright Files, and it has all of my <laughs> promos there because I, I threaten my opponents that they're going to spend more time with their loved ones. Unfortunately, it's going to be in the hospital for the first couple of weeks after the match, and it's all like, I don't actually mean I'm going to hurt you, but it is that, like, you need that different aura in it, and if it seems more believable, like, especially ECW, that is... In that time, did it feel like Paul Heyman basically said, here's a platform, do your best. It's it's not on you to sink or swim, but here's as much, and no pun intended with a collar or a leash, but here is your, uh, here's your leash and just do what you want to do. Like the creative freedom. Did you feel like there was a lot of that, that when the Rick Roods come in, the Scott Hall comes in for a weekend, like all those stuff that they don't feel so chained up by the WWF or WCW at that time? Absolutely. Because they give you script word to word what to say. Oh. Paul would just say, look, I need this point. One, I need two, the, the date, two, where it's going to be and who you're facing. You know what I mean? And then now that's all I want to tell you. Now you do it. Go, you know, and we would roll. And that's what we were trained to do. That's why everybody that's out there listening, that's in the business you, know, you got to practice your promos, especially if you're if you're young in the business. I say get in front of the mirror and and you you talk. And what I was taught from the old school guys back in the late '80s was, if you're going to wrestle somebody, you got to put them over. You got to make them sound better than they are. Otherwise, when you beat them, if you if you tell a like if I if I'm going to wrestle you, I'm going to be like you're the man. You know you're very vicious and. I know your hands are like stone. I know you're going to kick my ass, but <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You always yeah. put the guy over before you say, okay, you know, when the time comes and the leash comes off, wreak havoc because the mad dog of war is coming. Was there any specific matches that like taught you to be more aggressive in the ring? Like I know like you bringing down like the bulldogs and such, like I see that style and I'm very much inspired of that, those styles too. Was there any specific time in Germany or Japan or wherever where you had a match and you're like, Oh, I need to go a little bit harder. I need to just like go at this level, like a weird leveling up or evolution moment, like specifically one or two matches. Uh, that happened later in my career. Okay. Like when, around 2001, I was at working for Noah. Oh. And I remember I was oh, working, wow. but I was working more like American style because I, it's been a while since I've been in Japan mm -hmm. and I do strong style anyway. I mean, the pit bulls were known that this is what we were, this is how it was with us. 
we're, we're, we're able to adapt to anybody's style. Mm -hmm. If you were a luchador, we could wrestle you. If you are a J Japanese style, we can wrestle you strong yeah. style. You know what I mean? Every, any kind of style we can do. If you're a brawler, we'll brawl. If you want to, if you want to chain wrestle for 30 minutes, I'll chain wrestle you for 30 minutes. You know what I'm saying? So that's helped us anyway, as me and my partner to get work because everybody that, you know, they say, okay, we got to bring a tag team in who we're going to bring in right away. They would say, you know, so either to Samoans or somebody that's on the tour would say, well, the pit bulls are easy to work with. You know, so I ended up, for example, I ended up in Germany for three weeks and it just so happened I'm wrestling Beefcake and <laughs> Jimmy Snooker, you yeah. know, which I'm already tight with both of them. Yeah. I already know them both. So it's like, great. Oh, man, we got two weeks of great. This is going to be like awesome, man. You know, and this this was right after Brutus had his face smashed in. Oh, my God. Yeah. So he just got that mask off and he was like, look, Gar. Anthony, you know, please, you know, whatever you do, just don't punch me in the face. You know what I mean? I'm like, no problem, brother. You know, so that two weeks, I learned a lot. Don't get me wrong, but we all four of us made it home safe and sound and we had money in our pockets, <laughs> you know, because that's the whole idea, you know? Hell yeah. Very the true. business. Well, Gary, going back to a big moment in your career was winning the very prestigious ECW TV championship. And I know uh, after Japan, you and Anthony came into ECW, and I think Anthony didn't stick around, and you did. So how did that come about, you actually winning the TV championship? We we were already working in Japan. And we like I said, we were already in ECW. People, it just got on television at that point. Mm -hmm. So I came home, I was injured, I had to get my knee fixed. Anthony went to Germany to work for Otto. Okay. Yeah, so he worked for Otto, and I was home recovering. I got better. Uh, I'm sitting home one night, two o'clock in the morning. I see ECW on TV. I'm like, "What? I'm an I made ECW. What are you?" Yeah. yeah. So I got on the phone immediately. I called, <laughs> I called Todd Gordon, and I told, and I called Sandman because I met Sandman in the er the late '80s. Okay, at, in Philadelphia. Uh, at Temple, a huge stadium they had there, and it was Tri-State Wrestling Alliance. Okay. Okay. Todd Gordon owned that, and Joel Goodhart owned that. Okay, that was Tri-State. That turned into Eastern, and then that turned into Extreme. Oh my god! <laughs> so that first that show I was at, I mean, and that that night, Ric Flair, Abdul the Butcher was in my locker room and shit like that, and they're telling us. You guys already wrestle, so you don't have to go in the ring because Abdul was putting a blade on every finger and he was going <laughs> to cut everybody. <laughs> and Ric Flair came up to us and said, listen, I want you guys. Are, you guys are the pit bulls? And we're like, yeah. He goes, all right, I heard about you, motherfuckers. He goes, I heard about you guys. So he's like, do me a favor. <clears throat> don't go out there. And I'm like, well, they told us we have to. He's like, no, I'm telling you, you're not. I said, okay, <laughs> I'm going to listen to you. You're Ric Flair. Yeah. So he gave, he just handed me a, a like two had to be five hundred grand worth of gold. I'm talking two watches and gold and diamond rings and these guys had money, man. I mean the shit they were wearing. He's like, you just stay back here and watch our jewelry. I said, okay, no problem. <laughs> and that night, I'm not gonna lie, that night we did a super hardcore match with like thirty people, and it ended up being me and Anthony, the last two guys in the ring. And Ant went over to rope on his own, and I won the match. Mm. And, it, and it, they put us over like Rover. Yeah. And that was Tri-State Wrestling Alliance. So we already had the tag belts before. Us and the Super Destroyers were the guys with the belts back in the day. So I don't care how many times you hear the Dudley say, oh, we were ECW Bro, you were still in diapers when I had an <laughs> ECW belt, you know? And like I said before, I met Sandman that night and Sandman's like, comes up to me. He's not even Sandman. He's James Fullington. Okay. And he's like, man, I want to do that. Can I get, I want to do that. And I'm like, well, look at you. You're tall. You're a big cat. Why don't you? So I said, you know what? This is what you need to do to get in this company is go to Joel Goodhart school. We had a wrestling school for the school, for the company. 
So that's how a lot of guys like Stevie Richards, Blue Meanie, you know, a lot of them guys that were from that area that got in ECW, the especially the original ones like Stevie, mm-hmm. he had, he did go to Joel Goodhart School, and uh, and it's it's funny too because I went to Japan, I came back, and there's Sandman. Okay, with, <laughs> right. a, with a surfboard in his hand and he's wearing a rubber suit and i'm like you're calling yourself sandman and you're wearing that i said i don't i said dude that would be you man drink beer and smoke cigarettes and that's what they ended up changing them, <laughs> oh you know what i mean God. so but he wasn't even like i said like i, I just pointed him in the right direction he, yeah he, he's a very good guy even though he's a drunk, he's a very good athlete. You know, <laughs> he's not a drunk. He's not a drunk, but right, right. That's his gimmick. That's his gimmick, and he's a good athlete, like I said. Yeah. You know, oh, that's great. He used to play rugby. Whoa, really? Yeah, Hack used to play rugby, man. So you got to be pretty tough and pretty strong to play rugby. One hundred percent. Yeah, you think you get mean in that game? Yes. And then, so for you winning the TV title, I mean, that must have meant so much, right? At the time, in the list of those I people, was, it's I didn't even. I told I told uh, Paul I didn't want the belt. Why not? Yeah, because I wanted to be a tag team, and I told him my partner's coming, and he's like, "Well, just in the meantime, you know what I mean? Why don't you just, you know, you know, JT Smith is injured. You might as well beat him and take the strap, and you know, you're going to be. It's a good idea to do it because you're going to be in a long line of unbelievable wrestlers that had that belt i don't care what anybody says the ecw television championship belt is is the number one belt from ecw if you add that belt i mean you're talking malenko's guerrero's i I just could go on and on and on on jericho's i mean people that had that strap i mean there's a list Japanese guys had that strap. Mike Awesome had that strap. It was maybe a group of maybe 20 people, not even, that had that belt. And I'm talking the original yeah. TV belt. Yeah, right. It had the one plate, and it was all leather. That's the original f-ing strap. And I, like I said, I told I told Paul no, and he looked at me like I was f-ing crazy. He's like, what are, right. you ta- are you nuts? You got good promos. You could talk the shit. He's like, uh, you'll be 20 minutes on television every f-ing week. Come on, do this, do this. So he never saw me do a promo, really. You know, so he goes, I'm taking a chance on you. So just cut this promo. I said, you know what? All right. He got me a little riled up. Plus, I drove all the way to New York. I had to drive like two hours from Philly. You know, so I was like a little pissed, too. And I wasn't getting paid. <laughs> yeah. but, but I'm getting the strap and I'm still bitching, you know. So that's just me. But I remember I cut the promo and I fucking slapped JT Smith across the face as hard as I could. And he was on crutches and he hit the <laughs> ground. Okay. And I turned to the camera and said, You know who I am? I'm the pit bull. I'm number one. Umoro Uno. Which doesn't make any sense. <laughs> <laughs> And no bullshit, Paul Heyman, Paul Heyman grabbed his hand, covered his nose and mouth, snot coming out of his nose. He literally fell and had to run out of the, the room because we were still rolling and he didn't want to f- the, 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 it was too perfect to get f- up. And was this a so basement wanna... promos? Yeah, we were in a basement where in New York and I cut the promo. It's a t- it's on television. Yeah. If you get an old tape, you'll find it. Yeah. And it was he, when he came back in the room, he was just dying. I remember Paul's face was so red. JT was still on the ground, like still stunned. And I'm like, I'm sorry, man. I'm sorry I hit you, but I had to lay yeah. it in. You know, I, mean? I had to lay it in. And even though I, I didn't say uh, Umaro, I did Umaro Uno. Um- it, was to be, it was supposed to be oh Numero Uno. Yeah. Or whatever. <laughs> And Numero. they they said leave it in there because it's fucking awesome. So we left it in there, and he gave me the strap that next TV tape. That's incredible. That... And then they started me right away against Taz, mm-hmm. and right, they, he was right. my first victim. I, I beat Taz, Taz tried to take my belt, and I beat him one, two, three in the middle of the ring, bro. So I'm so sorry. I have two questions going off of that for the fact that uh, 
I had a similar experience literally this past Saturday. I uh, I had a match and there was a manager who was on the wrong side of the ring and it was a hardcore match and I needed to get the weapons that I was going to use. And this dude, he's not like trained. He's a friend of a friend. He's in decent shape, but he's not in a, a tremendous shape. And he was just in my way, especially it being a hardcore match. And I, I literally slapped him across the face of, I, it was very safe. It was on the neck, but it was hard. He wasn't expecting it. He's the one that f***ed up. And I had that moment with him afterwards. I'm like, I apologize, but you know why I had to do that of you were ruining the match. And secondly, or cause off of that, of having that intense, the intensity. And like, I brought that up of, it was a credibility. I was in a hardcore match. He was in the way and he wasn't moving away from it. He wasn't even getting in my face. He was just staring at me literally where I had to grab the weapons that I placed earlier that he was supposed to be on the other side of the ring. And being a smaller guy, like you have to be that intense of like, you can't take shit from people because especially when you're in the locker room with Hogan earlier, beefcake, all these tall guys of just jacked and, on whatever they're on at that point in time but like everything yeah, yeah of keeping that intensity but then also you being a tag team guy and taking pride of that of being almost so unselfish at your own cost like those are the two questions i have of when did you realize you need to be that intense to protect yourself especially going in with taz who has that similar mentality and then also where did the unselfishness come from is that from like growing up in family and like friend circles yeah absolutely i was brought up differently than kids today i mean i'm 54. uh we came like i said i came from a small farm town we were the Actually, we're the blueberry capital of the world Ooh. where I'm from. I mean, we had 30, our town was maybe what, three miles by three miles. I mean, wow. 33 million heirs living there, you know, because it's all farm land. Uh, shit. I mean, we didn't realize we were going to, I mean, I would sit and watch wrestling with my grandpa on Saturdays, mm -hmm. you know, and I remember watching Hulk Hogan and Mr. Wonderful and, I would love superstar Billy Graham and Bruno San Martino and Mil Mascaris. And I was like, man, I would love to do that. But then I'm thinking to myself, look how big these guys are. How am I going to get that big? You know what I mean? Like, it's not going to happen. And then later on, and the next thing I know, I'm talking to Hulk Hogan or, you know what I mean? And it's like, you, I'm like, I made it. You know, I'm here now, you know, especially ECW. It was a totally different locker room than most locker rooms, you know what I mean? Like our locker room, it was like, they let us use our talent, you know what I mean? Like if it's gonna make you better, it's up to you. Like they gave you the reins, you know, they gave you the saddle, ride that motherfucker. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Is what they would do. And they would put us in situations like where you, like there was, I remember we won the television straps and I remember the match went fucking Perfect. It was 1995 double dog collar match, uh, best out of three falls. Mm -hmm. And there had to be seven different angles in that match. And I'm still to this day, I'm like, how the hell did I remember and get through that? You know yeah. what I'm saying? And come to find out that was number one match in 1995. It's up there with uh, Razor Ramon and the Heartbreak Kid ladder match. Wow. They were one and we were two. Uh, they were one and I think we were two. But as far as me and Ant working together and getting that intensity, uh, being a tag team so long, I know what he's thinking. He knows what I'm thinking. Mm -hmm. uh, if you watch our work, I mean, this is how I could tell you, this is how I judge how good tag teams are. Do they click together? You know, how do they work together? And the look at that is to watch a tag team. You'll notice me and Ant will go out of the ring the same time. We're back in the ring the same time. No matter if he's on one side or I'm on the other side, we're both thinking the same way. You know what I mean? I only have to point to a corner and say, you know, top rope. And he knows what the spot is. Because it'll be all like every night we would work, we would do a brand new double tag team spot. So we would add another, another move to our arsenal. So you figure all the matches we had. We had a lot of moves that were vicious from the guillotine. I remember the guillotine was uh, Anthony would sit on the top. I would vertical suplex Stevie up to him. 
I'd come out with a neck breaker. He would do a power bomb. We knocked yeah. him out. Okay? <laughs> he, put, he, he was f***ing snoring in the corner. Because <laughs> I had his head and I heard him snoring. I was like, oh, shit. So, and then when people would take our super bomb, you know, they would bitch. You know, a lot of time, a lot of guys would be like, oh, f I got to take this finish. I got to take the finish. I'm like, dude, you're not, it looks worse than it is. I had to take it. The yeah. <laughs> If you, if you watch and follow the ECW, you found out that during our match, they actually super bombed me and Anthony. But we just didn't sell it. We just got right back up and said, no sell. <laughs> they just beat the shit out. No sell. Oh, so, I mean, great. but our style, like I said, we, in this business, I learned you got to be able to be flexible. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And, and then and there's little opportunities that come that are going to come here and there. You got to make sure you take advantage of them when they yeah. do come. You know, and if you get a chance to work with somebody that's been working longer than you or has worked in other countries and you, you know what I'm saying, that's great because you're going to learn from that. You know, I mean, to this day, I'm 54. I'll get in the ring and I'll pick up something new. You know what I mean? Like I, I'm old school. I like to watch Tiger Mask, Dynamite Kid, mm -hmm. uh, Eddie Guerrero versus Dean Malenko. You know, I like that's when I'm in my wrestling mode. Like I'll get in the ring and I can do that kind of shit. And then I can do the style like Lager, Thunder Lager and Hayabusa where they're flying everywhere and I'm catching them. And then I could do the street fights. I mean, it's just, you have to be flexible and be able to work with everybody. Cause I'll tell you right now, if I was working with you, okay. And we were in the locker room, I would tell you, listen, brother, just sit back, Johnny Cash, I'll sit back. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay and listen to all these people talk yeah. just listen to them and you're going to sit there and you're going to say you're finally going to open your ears and you're going to like like listen you're going to be like this motherfucker's calling this spot this motherfucker's calling that spot he's calling this spot that's 15 clotheslines i already heard 15 clotheslines oh whip reverses uh duck this <laughs> here's what i'm going to say johnny here's the finish okay <laughs> boom 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 we go home that's it. Yeah. Okay. When I throw you out of the ring, I'm going to put you through a table. I'm going to toss you back in the ring. It's time to go. Hell and yeah. you're going to know the finish. Other than that, we're going to talk out there and have a good time. My That's favorite. how you're supposed to do it. And you listen to the crowd. Mm -hmm. You control them. Don't let them control you. Yep. You know, if they were, if they sit there, they could boo the shit out of me when I'm a heel. I'll snap, marry you and put you in a headlock and tell them Fuck you. Yes. I ain't doing shit. And I'll lay there for 10 minutes with you. Mm -hmm. and let them check your hand. Let them check your hand. Finally, once you start shaking and they're getting sick of me and they're backing you up, bro, that's when we're going to get up and we're going to give them something big. Yep. They're going to pop. You know? That's old school. That's how I wrestle, man. When I was in Puerto Rico, you know, I didn't get to sit with the heels. You know what I mean? They had their own locker room and the baby faces had their own locker rooms. I didn't get to talk to – I only talked to the referee. I didn't see the guy until I got in the ring. <laughs> You know, and imagine at the first time never doing that before. But then once you do it, you go back and you're like, oh my God, that was so fucking easy. Yep. Like it, that was a fucking piece of cake. You know, why get all stressed out about all and they call too many fucking spots, man. Stop. Work a fucking body part. Work an arm, work a leg, work a work something. Yep. <laughs> you know, I'm I'm not into all these flips. I mean, I like I said, I, me and my partner wrestled Ray Mysterio Jr. Mm -hmm. and I think it was like Juventus Guerrero. Okay. Okay. They were the first two Mexicans to come to the United States. We were the first two guys to ever wrestle them in Queens on Queens Boulevard in New York. Wow. And we had a hell of a match, you know. But when I saw them, I remember Paul Heyman said, Yo, you guys. All right, Pitts, come here. And so we go over. He's like, all right, this is how the locker room was. Okay. You're working there. All right. You're going over. Get it together. Go. I want about 20, 30 minutes. All right. You got it. You know? Then I stopped and I'm like, wait a minute. Who are you talking about? Those two? He's like, yeah. You go, they're 13 years old kids. They're like 12 years old kids. <laughs> and he's like, no, 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 no. They're, that's a Guerrero. I was like, oh my God, really? Holy shit. <laughs> He goes, don't worry, they put masks on. I was like, oh, okay, the luchadors. I said, I got it. <laughs> so I went over, introduced myself, you know, because I already knew 
Ray's dad, because mm-hmm. I already wrestled him in New Zealand. My first two tours ever was in, to New Zealand against the British Bulldogs, and the, the next the la- the next tour was with the Guerrero brothers, Hondo and Mondo. Wow, that's Eddie's dad and Ray Mysterio's dad. And then the fi- another one with, it was with Hondo and Strong. I forget his name. It was big, strong guy. They called him. I forget. And then the Bushwhackers was the last one that we were on tour with them. You wrestled and the Bushwhackers in New Zealand? In front of 55,000 people. Fuck. It was amazing, bro. I mean, I'm not going to lie. I never, that was the biggest, like I worked in front of Vince's crowds, but they were like in the 20,000s. I never seen 55,000 before, and I couldn't believe it when I saw it because I honestly could have shit my, I should almost shit my pants. <laughs> like, I'm like, we didn't even have to, like, you know, how sometimes you may drink a beer and get a little buzz going, yeah. get your, get your mind moving and thinking, you know what I'm saying? So you think of shit in the ring, you know, it just, it just works that way. Uh, I like to smoke a little bit of cannabis and that gets me thinking good, you know? And I remember we were in, New Zealand the first time and we were green as grass and British Bulldogs were right across the hall and Larry Sharp was our manager and he went across the hall to get the finish, came back. We we're main event and this is Don Morocco's gig, you know, so we're main event in New Zealand and they put us as the American Pit Bulls versus the British Bulldogs, which is a British commonwealth is New Zealand. So they're, they're British, it's kind of, you know, the queen owns that joint and <laughs> Bro, he came back with his head down and he's just shaking his head. And I'm like, Larry, what the hell, you you know, what's the finish? And he looked at me and said, there ain't no finish. They're going to call it out there and you got to do 45 minutes. And we're like, okay, you know, and all that was, was a test. Yep. Because the British Bulldogs right off the bat, they had a freaking attitude, man. Because they're like, who the fuck are these fucking guys? Mm-hmm. And they're, they're calling themselves the pit bulls. We're the Bulldogs. Yep. Yeah. And they trying to steal our gimmick. You know what I'm saying? I guess that's what they were thinking. Who knows, you know? And they were testing us because back then, them guys in the 80s, you know, that's how they would test you yeah. to see how you're going to, how am I going to react to this? Well, am you I gonna really be earn it, right? What's that? Uh, sorry, uh, like you really earn it. It's not just, oh, you graduated your wrestling school, you know how to yeah. put together a it match, was so here it like, is. They were pretty much, pretty much what they were doing was, number one, are they going to come to the ring? And number two, how are they going to perform? Yeah. So that's how I looked at it. I said, listen, let's just go in there and kick some fucking ass. You know what I mean? We're here. We're across. We're on the other side of the fucking world. We have nothing to lose. Yeah. Let's just fucking, we, we, we could take it. Let's just fuck him up. Let's just go. <laughs> so we went out there and worked with them and we did 45 minutes and it, it I'm not going to lie. It got really hot at, in that ring i remember they punched anthony in the jaw and i came in and took fucking, i took fucking dynamite's head off man i'm telling you i tried to and i didn't even know he had a broken collarbone and he mm. still was there that's how crazy dynamite yeah. is yeah and we did the fucking match we put him over clean the place went fucking crazy we got drunk and we went to bed and i just remember waking up the next fucking day I walked across the hall and I'm thinking, you know, what the fuck, Larry's already up and I don't understand. I walked in their room. So I'm like, oh, fuck, I'm going to get my ass kicked. There we go. Yeah. And they pulled me aside. They were already fucking drunk, drinking VO straight. And they poured me a drink and said, get your fucking partner's ass in here. I want to <laughs> talk to you guys. And they sat us down and they pretty much ripped us ass and said we fucking did great because we were hoping you were going to fuck up so we could fucking send your asses home. He goes, but you guys are good guys. And I learned, I learned a lot that two weeks, man, you, just working against them two guys. I learned so much that that's when I realized I got to start working guys that are better than me mm-hmm. and been in the business longer than me. Cause I'm not going to get better unless I do that. So as soon as we got back from that one tour, I remember Larry would send us to work for Vince. Like if they were in Niagara Falls or if they were in Hershey Park, we would show up and we would do jobs. But hey, man, I got to work the Hart Foundation. I got to work yeah. Twin Towers. I got to work the Rougeau Brothers. I got to work Boss Man and Akeem. 
every tag team that was legit in the 80s, I got to work every one of them. And all I did was look, get experience. Yeah. And it helped out tremendously. Can I ask you, like, because of being a tag team guy and, like, I had a solid, like, year and a half of, like, it, I was in a tag team and in a faction, so I just got to drive with my friends all the time and just have That's matches. Cool. Like, you you speak so fondly of your wrestling journey. Like, do you think having your boy with you along for the ride the whole time all over the fucking world made it of, like, it's us against the world and you're enjoying it all the time? Yeah, because... Now I travel by myself and it sucks. Yeah. It sucks. It fucking sucks. Uh, after 9 11, just getting on a plane now sucks. Mm -hmm. I mean, we used to have a fucking blast. Anytime, every single time I would get step on a plane and sit down, the stewardess would come over, bring me a fucking can of soda and four Jack and Cokes, Jacks, four bottles of Jack mm -hmm. for each of us. Every single fucking time, nine eleven happened. Soon as I got when I wake up to go to the airport, that's when my job starts. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, and I have to travel, and then I got to jump in a car, then I got to go to the building. You know, to me now that I'm older, wrestling is the easiest part of my job. Getting dressed is the hardest, mm -hmm. and getting undressed—that's a pain in my fucking ass. <laughs> But that's just me. I mean, it's just, you'll see, because you got eight years in now, so you're at that point. Yeah. You're there now. Now you, all you could do is go up. You know, when I was starting, that that they told me back in the 80s, nobody's going to look at you until you got at least seven years under your belt. Yeah. Which really wasn't true. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? But they would set you up so you can get that experience. So like Vince liked, actually it was Gorilla Monsoon who liked us because mm -hmm. he was from New, New Jersey and we're Jersey guys. Uh, yeah. And the way I look at it is he called up and said, look, Larry, we like these guys. We're going to bring them in. We were supposed to be there before the Hardy boys. Actually, the nasty boys actually took our spot Wow. because we turned them down. We had a better deal with Japan. They gave me a better deal, more money. Uh, less time. I only had to wrestle uh, 25 weeks. No, 20, yeah, 25 weeks a year. That's half a year, right? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So I only had to work half a year and I was making a lot of, a lot of money. And then that's not even counting my ECW contract. Mm -hmm. So I was able to do both. That's really cool. Holden, I want to go to you for something coming up in your career, you're taking place in the Barry Wrestling uh, tournament that's coming up, right? The Brackets, which Correct. I know is going to be, it's, it, there's a lot of great talent. I just want to get your mindset heading into that. Uh, there's a lot of great talent in it, but I'm focused on myself. I know for, we're just coming out of a pandemic and I know a lot of people haven't been training the last year and a half. I know that me and my core group of friends, like we, we take rest. The fact that earlier you said it's a business, it's about money. I, one of my pet peeves in wrestling is people like just using the term wrestling business. And I know that they get paid $20 for the show and they've been wrestling for 10 years. Like, that's what I like. I'm a huge wrestling fan. I have wrestling stuff all around me, but like, it's still a business. Like you can call it an industry. You can have fun in it. But a business means you get paid for it. Like, Gary, that was your profession. That was your full-time job where a lot of people, yeah, it's a fun little hobby. I take it a little more seriously than some of my contemporaries. And I've we literally all pulled our resources together, borrowed someone's ring. It's the most Canadian thing because I'm from just outside of Toronto, Ontario. And uh, we literally found a barn. We rented the space. We put a ring in there. We put like a squat rack. We're doing like p deck of cards, like push up squats. Like we're going as bare bones with it. And I know I've been training the last four months to wrestle without any bookings coming up. The tournament's there now. And hey, if if you and I brought up credibility earlier, if you're not performing at your best, that's not my problem to lift you up. That is like hearing the British Bulldogs and you guys 45 minutes, we're going to see it out there. It's a test every time you're out there. And that's what is the difference between someone that takes it seriously and someone that does it just for fun. And there's nothing wrong with doing it just for fun. But I personally have had a bad family life of delusional people and blaming other people or 
hoping for the best but not actively doing the best so in that tournament i i know i wrestled 115 matches in 2019 and i take this seriously for the fact of i don't care who's in front of me i know that i am hard-headed enough that I'm just going to make it through and prove that I'm one of the best in Ontario. And sooner or later, people will know I'm one of the best in Canada. I was going to break out into the States in 2020 before the world all shut down. And I didn't blame the pandemic for the pause. Like the pandemic screwed everything up. Everyone got affected by it. It wasn't just wrestling. And there's a lot of wrestlers that last year said, oh, 2020 was going to be my year. By March 13th, which is before the lockdowns happened in Ontario, I was at 20 matches. These motherfuckers that were like, oh, 2019 was going to be my year, 2018. You could be delusional. I'm going to wrestle the best. I'm going to learn from people like this opportunity to ask Gary these questions and someone that loves wrestling. Like those are the people that I love that you're 54 and you've not said one bad thing about wrestling. Like that's what I inspire to. I agree. 20 yeah. years. Yeah, I mean, I, I just think like a lot of guys, like sometimes I'm in locker rooms and I'll tell somebody, look, I'll give you the office. And they just look at me like, what does that mean? I'm like, what, you, what, what does that mean? I said, okay. So I'm like, who trained you? And I would ask them. And then I have to end up showing them what the office is. I just you know, taught someone what an Iggy was like three weeks ago. They didn't know and they've been wrestling for five years. What was that? Uh, I uh, I taught them what a little Iggy was for uh, oh. for chain wrestling. They're like, well, what are you doing while I'm like in control? And they didn't know that I wanted them to reverse it. They're like, well, what are you doing? I was like, wait, how how don't you? Know? And that's where I looked at my privilege of I didn't understand how well I was trained and how many good people. Because anytime there was a seminar, which I, I want to ask you because I wanted to add a little more difficulty in pro wrestling. I started... I want to see what it's like on the promoting side of wrestling and doing stuff like that, that, um, <laughs> no, you don't. Oh, no, I, I, I learned already slightly, but it's, uh, my purpose of that. I don't want a big promotion. It's, I see promoters that do the right thing. I see promoters that do the wrong thing. I want to do more right. And like your thought process, like, are you able to come to Toronto and do a seminar next summer? I would love to. And let me tell you something. Do a lot of people, they fear my seminars because they're very tough. I'm not going to yes. lie. I put, you, I put you through fucking hell for 45 minutes. That's before you even get in the ring, you know, but that's part of the business, mm -hmm. man. I mean, Ric Flair wouldn't be who he was if he didn't get in that plane crash. He was a 300 and something yeah. pound guy. He was a big fucking dude, man. And when I was in North Carolina, I would go to Ricky Steamboat's gym. Lee Haney would lift there. Uh, Holy Field would lift there. I mean, bad motherfuckers, man. And we were always in there every fucking day, me and Anthony. And who's there doing cardio on a fucking stepper for an hour straight? Yep. Ric Flair. Okay. So we worked out and we he didn't do an hour, but we would do at least 30 minutes yep. of cardio. But our job after that was to go get beer for the, the Colonel, Robert Fuller, in Tennessee <laughs> Stone. Cause him and Matt Bourne were hanging by the pool waiting for us. So that was our job. Always bring back a case of Bush. <laughs> <laughs> Shit, man. Gary, uh, we'll, we'll start to wind it down here. This has been awesome. I had one career specific question for you actually about somebody uh, who was on the show shortly before he passed a hardcore icon, New Jack. Um, and I'm curious if you had any New Jack stories or memories from working with him, being with him in ECW. Oh, yeah, me and New Jack were tight, man. Yeah, you could you uh, just listen to New Jack's last interview he did. Uh, you will see. Huh? Yeah. Uh, well, it wasn't Dark Side of the Ring. It was the last one he did on uh, Facebook and all that stuff. He meant, yeah. Actually, they asked him, like, who do you keep in touch with? And, you know, who you stay in touch with and who are you tight with? And he literally looked in the camera and said, Gary Wolf, the pit bull. So I was always tight with New Jack. It's just that yeah. a lot of people don't understand there's a gimmick and then there's a real person. Mm -hmm. Now, Jack, as a person, he's the funniest motherfucker and best cook in the world. He's great. <laughs> Love that. But as New Jack 187, the psycho stabbing motherfucker, 
that's how people think he is. And he's not like that. I mean, I had people calling me up. Can you call New Jack for me? I'm afraid to talk. To <laughs> it's ridiculous, you know, and it's a shame and it sucks because I was just with him in New York. We were doing a double signing the whole weekend together. And then uh, we were hanging out at the airport, chilling. Uh, I ended up getting a call to go to California for a signing and they wanted to bring New Jack too. So I, I hit him up, told him, yeah. He said, no, I ain't doing it. They got to send me money. I'm like, bro, relax, man. <laughs> he said, they're going to buy you a ticket to go to California. I think that's good enough. Like, that means you're buying. I said, you could trust me. And he can't. And he always did. And uh, I seen him in Florida for WrestleMania. And uh, we were supposed to go to California together. I talked to him two days before he passed away. And then I had just, I was in fucking shock. I mean, I even lost my own partner. Yeah. I'm kind of numb. I'm numb to the whole wrestlers dying shit now because I'm just numb. I can't. I can't cry no more. I can't. I don't even feel anything anymore. You know what I mean? Uh, it's just. It's just. It's our business. It's our lifestyle. We chose this road. You know. You know. When I was younger, I used to sit there and say, you know, I'm not here for a long time. But I'm here for a fucking good time, mm -hmm. you know. Now I'm 54. I'm like, I didn't think I'd make it. I didn't think I'd make five four, you know. So just take what you get. Try to learn as much as you can because you're still young, brother. How old are you? Uh, I Johnny Cash. I turned 29 in a couple months. You're still a baby. Yeah. Your your thirties are your prime, yeah. and it's good you got eight years in. Now you're ready to rock and roll, man. Yep. You know what I mean? You're ready to rock and roll. It's just maybe we will cross paths. Oh, bro, I'm booking you next summer. <laughs> and I uh, get to work with you, man, because uh, I think it'll be fun. And yeah. believe me, I know I'll learn something. I know you're going to learn something. Oh, bro. I can't wait for that war. Dude, I'm the easiest. I mean, don't get me wrong. You potato me. You're going to get a receipt and you'll know it. No potatoes, you know no potatoes, no <laughs> potatoes. I, I learned in the first couple of years of receipts and such. I'm now on the <laughs> other end of giving the receipts, so I get it. Good, because I'll talk a quick story real fast. Please. I, yeah. I got back in ECW. They put me with Sandman. <laughs> Sandman potatoed me <laughs> hard in the jaw. Like he hit me right in the jaw. So I snapped, mirrored him, and jumped, and I gave him a nice Arn Anderson knee right to the face. Dude. I mean, that's <laughs> But I still pulled it, but I but I did. I'm not going to lie. I made it real stiff, bro. Yep. After I hit him, all I heard was, oh, what the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> and we went, I went in the back, and I'm waiting for him to come out because he, he had to do the job for me. So I remember him coming back in the locker room. He's like, what the fuck was that? I said, that was called, that was a receipt. He goes, what the fuck is a receipt? <laughs> I said, because you, fucking, you stiffed me, you potatoed me. So a receipt is I'm just going to give you something back hard mm -hmm. to show you don't fucking do that again. And he looked at me and he goes, okay, man, cool. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, was he, was he going to, you know, he ain't going to do nothing. He was just like, he knew his place yeah. and he was wrong. And it was, he, he learned something. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That match. Yep. <laughs> Definitely. Oh my God. That a was... Pleasure being on the show guys. Pleasure. Oh, thank you both so much. This has been so much fun. Yeah. I that old, that story finishes off. I'm gonna tell you right now, you know what I'm about to say, and you know that you have to do it. Head over to wrestlingpins.bigcartel.com right now. You're going to not regret it. You're going to pick up some pins, whatever pins I got over there right now, they're the best in the business, best merchandise out there. Go pick up some pins. Use the code RRR150FF, get 15% off your order, and I'll see you soon. Bless your daddy. Booker, Wooka, man, I feel good. I tell my people and my brothers and sisters, don't you dare, don't you dare miss online. Rewind, recap, relive. Oh, yeah.